Hi, is this Kit? It is. All right, well, let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our featured guest this evening. She is a jewelry designer, and she is carrying on the legacy of her famous mother, the daughter of Eartha Kit. We are very excited to welcome the one and only Kit Shapiro to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I think it's awesome that you're honoring your mother because there's too many people, I, I guess not so much anymore, uh, like the daughter of Joan Crawford and people that just wants to be sensational and sell books. And there's not enough people like you that really respected their parents. I thank you for that. Well, I appreciate you saying that. Um, I grew up with a mother who instilled respect for um, your elders, respect for the environment, respect for other people, and respect for the world that we live in. So um, I, I really don't feel that I, it was never even something I would think of doing any other way, but honoring her because I was so blessed to have, uh, have had her for a mother. Absolutely. Now, I, I wanted to kind of start off because uh, I want to talk a lot about uh, the perception of Eartha, because for people that are fans of Eartha's and either remember or have done their research, she was so much more than what she is usually now, you know, typecast as. Um, so growing up, when did you realize, you know, that your mom was a famous actress and a singer? Um, and, and how did you come to terms with that? I know a lot of celebrity children have problems with that, especially growing through adolescence. Well, I, I, I like to say that, that um, I was a perfect fit for, for being my mother's daughter, you mm -hmm. know, and, and I remember as a very as a little tiny girl um, saying to her, you know, God picked me to be, you know, to be yours. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was just something, I, I think I just always knew that somehow we were, I mean, we have this, that we had this relationship that was this love story that was a connection of, that was, I think, much deeper because my mother was just a my very deep person. But she would often introduce us and she would say, I'm Eartha and this is Kit, <laughs> as if somehow I, I completed her. Right. And I think in, in so many ways, you know, she had a, such a difficult childhood and upbringing and had you know so many <laughs> obstacles as, as many people have not unique to her but as many people have that I really did complete her I think I gave her the the roots um, the foundation that she yearned for her you know a, a, as a young girl and on some level I don't know how or why um, I knew that I understood at a very early age that I I I was there for a reason. And I was really good with sort of being, um, you know, her, her, I don't want to say the second banana because she never treated me that way. You know, I was like the most important thing in her life. But I was really good at being the daughter of her and giving her that stability. Right. Now, as I say that, I don't want people to think that, you know, my life was this, you know, <laughs> this incredible, you know, everything was always fabulous and mm -hmm. happiness. I mean, as, a, as an adolescent, you know, yeah, did I often drive down the street, you know, with, drive in the car with my mother and hope that the door would just open and she'd just roll right out because <laughs> she was talking? You know, I mean, I was, it was a typical teenager where, you know, she made me crazy and I didn't want her to talk and please don't sing in public because it's, it's more, you know, I was mortified. So, I mean, you know, we had a, a typical mother-daughter relationship in many, many ways, but um, I was truly blessed to know on some very, very deep level that, um, you know, I kind of served this purpose on this planet, um, certainly for her. Um, so, you know, and that's, that is, just, I don't know why that was, it just, it, I was just lucky to have had that. And I knew it, if, I, I understood how, how much my mother loved me. And believe me, there were times when I was an adolescent and a 20 something old that I thought she loved me too much. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Well, you but, know, you, you know, know uh, I knew that, and that, and that in itself is a blessing to really know that you're that loved by. Yes, by absolutely, that. absolutely. You, you know, the thing with your your peers, your other kids that you know and hang out with, or whatever, teenagers, or, or I don't even know if you went to public or private school, but your mother's kind of music wasn't really the kind of music that was uh, music that you know your generation was listening to. I mean, it was kind of like you know back in the day type of music great music I, I suppose she had that coolness because of Catwoman 
and Batman. Right. But what did your your friends think of her? I mean, did they think she was square? Did they think she was hip? So I went to a private school. I went to a French school in Los Angeles. Uh, I went to the Lycée Francais. And because I went to French schools, and, and, and the reason I went to French schools, was, boy, we could, we could have a whole show on just on that, and why I went to um, a foreign school. Um, my mother believed that it was important to, to speak more than one language, um, and she spoke many, and she learned them, you know, just by visiting countries and, and living there. And she, she, uh, she felt that um, private education was, was a better place for me, that, and, and certainly as far as being a famous person, I would, be, I would have some more privacy and be better protected. But she also felt that, that the European system, you learned more about world history and uh, world geography than you did in an American uh, public school, and, um, uh, which is probably which is true. I mean, Europe and, and the rest of the world are connected in diff- different ways, and certainly you know, we're sort of standing on our own in the United States, and we're much younger. So it was a, it was that was sort of a whole complex reason. She, she spoke Spanish and, and English to me at home, and I spoke French in school. Mm. And so my friends' parents, who were all diplomats and other celebrities, some of them um, and their children, uh, had a different understanding of the industry and uh, you know, what it was like to either be a famous person, a child of a famous person, or somebody who, who traveled extensively throughout the world. So it wasn't quite the same way as you know, going to a public school. That being said, this was Los Angeles, and many people were also in the industry. So it wasn't like I lived, you know, in a in you know the Northeast or Middle America where it would have been you know an anomaly to see a celebrity. Right. Uh, I lived in Beverly Hills, so it was um, you know so people weren't as surprised. There were lots of people from from the industry, the entertainment industry, from many generations. Um, and and you're right. Batman was a very big reason why you know my mother's cool factor <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> remained, um, at, at, you know, at, at a high level. She was also such a unique person that when you know my friends would meet her, they found her just to be like, you know, she was so eclectic that be, a, you know, if she wasn't their mother, she they thought she was you know the funniest and, and coolest thing ever. Right. Now, in talking, I of course, I of course wanted her to be, you know, like a regular boring school teacher. Cause, you know, who wants to have the mother that's like the eclectic one? I, I still think it would have been fun if you'd have been going to school like in the middle of Iowa and you brought your mom in dressed as Catwoman. That would have just freaked everybody out. Now, yeah, just what you want is your mother to show up at a party and and purr for everybody. Right, and all the exactly. Kids, and like, oh, yeah, cool. Well, it had to make Halloween really easy, though, right? <laughs> That is true. That is very true. Now, in talking about uh, Catwoman, I mean, we were talking about this a little bit before the interview. Uh, It's interesting to me that Eartha is now predominantly remembered in the annals of pop culture as Catwoman, even though she had this huge career as a singer, a dancer. She did theater. She did movies. She did tons of TV. What did she think, and what do you think about the fact now that she is predominantly remembered as Catwoman from Batman? Because according to IMDb, she was only in I think like five or so episodes. And that to me is that's just sort of the, the the irony of the, of of it all because she was in so few um, episodes, and she wasn't. You know, Julie Newmar was the original Catwoman, right? Mm-hmm. And so the fact that my mother has been identified, you know, and, and noted as as being the, is being Catwoman is so interesting on many levels, and I, and I find, in fact, I was recently out at the Hollywood Museum. They did the unveiling of the Catwoman exhibit, right. and I thought, you know, when, and I spoke, and I think it was, you know, an interesting time. I mean, my mother wore this cat, this suit that was incredibly body conscious, <laughs> and she was a woman of color. In the, you know playing a very strong female character, even though she was the villain, and there was sort of this like sexual tension between you know Batman and Catwoman. So when you think about like where we were in the world, you know at this time in the 1960s, to have this you know this this woman of color uh, 
being, you know, this this strong. I mean, and now, of course, we're talking about the TV series Batman, and it was campy as it was. You mm -hmm. really can't take it seriously, but you still can sort of, you know, use that and realize that was a really big step for all the parties involved, from the network to the, you know, to the producers and, and directors and and the people who signed off on, on my mother being cast as that, and for my mother as well. Television wasn't the same thing as it is today, where, you know, famous people didn't really jump on the bandwagon, yet they were just all people who realized that television was a, a very, you know, medium that would been, wouldn't take away from their mm -hmm. cool factor. Um, so I really think that, you know, she was such a trailblazer, and that this was a character that was, you know, used her sexuality... Um, and her femininity to sort of, you know, play this game with this, you know, this superhero. Um, and there's a lot of strength from women's perspective. Mm -hmm. And whether you want to say, you know, should use your sexuality or, or not, it's what the times were, certainly, and the character was. And I think my mother made it just, you know, show that the, the strength that there was even though that the character, the villain, didn't win in the end. But in some ways, she really did win. Right. She always seemed to have the upper hand. So I, th I think that there, it, makes, it makes sense on so many levels because it was, it was a political statement in some ways. It was a sociological statement in many ways. Um, you know, there was race involved, and, you know, men and women. It, it's so much greater than the, the campy, you know, cartoony type of feeling that we had, certainly when I was watching it at that age. Who, who saw any of that? and read anything into it. In, in talking about what you were saying about being a woman of color is absolutely true. We, we had Burt Ward, who played Robin on the show last week, and I was just talking to him about that and, and saying there really was only two shows that did that, and it was Batman right. and Star Trek, because Star Trek with Ahura, you know, who was right. a woman of color. Yep. And, okay, what did your mother say to you? Did she say anything about that? Did she feel that she was blazing a trail for, for women of color? Uh, you know, my mother had a, had a, a whole, I mean, growing up, you know, she experienced color obviously very differently than I did, needless to say. First of all, I was born when my mother was already famous. Um, for those people who have ever seen a picture of me, they will uh, obviously... <laughs> And for those people who, who claim that I am actually not my mother's biological child, which, of course, I think is quite comical because <laughs> as famous as she was, I don't think that any you know black woman could have ever adopted a white child in 1961. Yeah. But that being said, <laughs> um, <laughs> and the fact that I actually do look like my mother and I am her only child, right? Um, the, you know, I, I, you look at me and I have, you know, blonde hair and light skin and, and light eyes and... I don't, you know, I mean, you, I think people, some people can tell that I'm mixed, but I don't think people really think about it. So I didn't really have, obviously, the same experiences my mother had with race. And when my mother would talk about race to me, she talked about it in a way that it, it was, you know, she, was, she believed she was from the human race, mm -hmm. that she didn't have a color, and that as long as you insisted on, on put pigeonholing, as she would have used the term, people into categories where they were a specific color you it was it was yet another way to carry on another form you know yet another reason for prejudice i mean we had you know religion and and sex you know and and economic and so i mean all of the reasons why somebody could be um against another person that was one thing she never understood the need for categorizing human beings by the color of their skin given that nobody has the option to pick the color of their skin. There you go. Right. right. Now I have to I have to ask you about this. Now this happened uh, reportedly uh, before you were born, but I'm I believe and I'm sure Eartha was asked about this many times uh, in her career and in her life, including during some interviews that I'm sure that you were present for. Uh, now Eartha's first big break was in 1950 when Orson Welles gave her a role in a, one of his stage productions. And years later, in 1957, there was controversy. A lot of people tried to say that there was an affair, a love affair, between Orson Welles and Eartha Kitt. Did she deny that? Did she agree? Did she ever say anything about that that you ever heard of? Heard of? She, yeah, she said that uh, there was never a love affair between them, that she was very much enamored uh, by his 
presence. I mean, we have to remember, my mother was very tiny. She was five foot two and, you know, very petite, mm -hmm. although she had this very large persona. Most people didn't realize they were surprised when they would meet her, how small she was. And Orson Welles was much bigger. So there he had an, an, this sort of over, you know, this very big presence. And, it, and, and he had this creativity level that she was just, you know, fascinated by. And she would, he, he, he attracted crowds of, on a friend's basis where he would sit with authors and, and artists and creators and they would have these deep philosophical discussions which my mother was fascinated by. She, throughout her entire life, denied that there was ever a, a, you know, any love relationship between them, that it was purely, um, you know, she was like this protege and, and just sort of was, you know, in awe of him. Right. Now, that being said, I wasn't there. I don't know. <laughs> I can only speak to what I heard. I have no idea what really happened. Um, but, yeah, so she yeah, so she, she denied that that was, was, in fact, the reality. That, that's like the strangest thing in my head. I really can't see your mom and Orson together. That's, wow. I wonder. You know, my mother, it's so funny. She, I mean, she grew up, you know, she was born in this, this little town called North South Carolina, and she was, a, uh, you know, they were sharecroppers, and um, she was a, it was a cotton plantation, and she picked cotton, and she was mistreated because of the color of her skin in the South at the time. She was born in 1927. She was very light-skinned, and so she was referred to as a yellow gal, which, mm -hmm. you know, was not, was not a, a term of endearment. Mm -hmm. And so she was rejected by the community that she was in, and they treated her, as she would have said, worse than as Cinderella was treated. Yeah. So she, she learned and she, she watched, um, she observed, she didn't speak very much, she paid attention to nature and the animals and how things grew, and she understood the power of education, which of course meant the power of the, the importance of reading. And as my mother was able to get out of leave the South, she, she didn't voluntarily leave the South. She was her, an aunt sent for her in New York because the aunt was told that she was being so horribly abused that they were, you know, she could end up dead. So the aunt sent for her, and, and my mother would soak up everything that she could could learn and find. I mean, she would read the dictionary. She would read, um, you know, philosophy books. She loved Socrates and Plato. And so when she joined the Cap and Dunham dance troupe, and they went to Europe, and she then was exposed to these great minds that she'd been reading about in the New York City Public Library, you, you know, she's there in these cities, and she's learning... And then she's introduced to, you know, Orson Welles and this group that, that he would be around mm -hmm. for these great minds. You know, she became, she was like a little sponge, you know, and she would just go home. She would, she would tell me she would listen to all their conversation without many times understanding the names and the people that they were talking about or the books that they were referring to. And then she'd run the next day to, you know, the library and, and try to read and find out, learn more about all these people they spoke about. So she took that relationship as as just more learning. You know, every situation she was in, she felt was an opportunity to grow and to learn. Well, I know she was very smart, and I know she was opinionated because even uh, Bert Ward told me that he said she was a wonderful woman. He loved your mom. He likes you. He thinks you're cool. He he talked about meeting <laughs> you at the event, but yep. he talked about the thing about Eartha is, is she was really opinionated and troubled by a, a lot of things. But, you know, the other thing, too, she had to deal with is she had the magic of having intelligence, but also knew that sex sold, and, and your mom was so sexy and, and sultry in the way she talked and the way she sang and everything. But that kind of leads sometimes to a persona of being bad or being slutty or being yeah. evil. Even when I posted an image uh, on, on the uh, bulletin to advertise you coming on, I found a great drawing of Eartha, and I didn't realize what it said at the bottom. It said, Bad Eartha. <laughs> so that's kind of like the image she had. What did she think of this image? Everybody thought that she was like a really bad devious, person. Devious, you know, yeah. Almost the B word, would some people would say, you know? <laughs> Right. Well, my mother would often say, as there have been many women, you know, prior to the, you know, the world we really live in today, um, but it, certainly in my mother's time, the women who were strong were often referred to, you know, with the B word, yes. and, and the ones who had strong opinions, you know, and stood up for themselves, um, were often 
referred to that way, whereas the men who did equally the same thing were not, obviously, were just, you know, smart businessmen. Right. Um, and I think that she, she understood. Uh, my mother was very deliberate in the words that she chose and the moves that she made, I believe. Um, some people thought that she was, on some level, maybe somewhat conniving or... or uh, not she was not mean or mean spirited or, or hurtful to other people, mm -hmm. but I think that she was very smart. Where she saw um, she could use that part of her that that was who, what, who she was and how she was born to look and, and and sound. And because of her intelligence, she was able to use it to her advantage. That being said, you know she very she was as Bert Ward mentioned. You know she she had a lot of to deal with with the, her childhood and the abuse that she w that she went through, right. so I think that there was a lot of you know she had a lot of conflict and a lot of struggles with being standing up for yourself and being strong, um, allowing yourself to be vulnerable. Certainly on the public level, on the stage, she had that sort of sexuality which makes you vulnerable. But then when you get off the stage, people then think that that's who you really are, and now how do you protect yourself? So I think it was a real you know, it, it, the, I think she she really struggled on many levels throughout her life. Mm -hmm. But I do think that she understood for herself, being true to herself and and speaking her mind and being who she was, was the more important choice that she had to make. Now I know you um, mentioned it, uh, abuse, and I don't know if that was at the hands of of a woman or a man or family members or whatever that was, but. My favorite interview with your mother, I don't know the exact words, but somebody had mentioned to her something about her being manipulated by men, and she started laughing. Like, <laughs> that's not going to happen. And, 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 man, I'm telling you, I don't think any man in her later life had anything on your mother. I mean, am I right? That possibly because right. of abuse, it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean when, you know, as a child, she, you know, abuse was from men, and you know, was there were there were some women who who took care you know her mother um gave her away because her mother went to marry a man who wouldn't allow my mother given her skin color to live in his house mm. so the, her mother gave her away to a, a family who was very abusive the, the the mother was abusive and the children were abusive you know they were physically sexually and you know verbally abusive mm. and then i think you know as a, as a woman of color and a, and a beautiful woman and a sexy woman this, this abuse that you get, um, maybe not so much sexually, but you certainly get it, um, me, you know, in, in any industry um, when you when you look like you're vulnerable. Um, and so, I, I think that she she had a really hard time in relationships and personal relationships because she'd been hurt by a lot of early you know early relationships um, by men, white men. Who a few of them, who's you know one one in particular, who she was madly in love with, whose parents would not allow them to to you know marry because of my mother's skin color, um, no matter how famous she was, which mm. is interesting. But mm. um, so I yeah I think that she had you know I think men had a really <laughs> were conflicted because yeah she was not an easy person, yeah. she was not an easy person at all, and and you know you really. You know, be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. Because if you asked her a question, you were going to get her opinion. And you were not going to get, she was not going to allow you to push her around. That right. was sure. She well, did not, you know, did not take that well. Kind of kind of speaking of that, I mean, one of the things that, that I love about your mother and that I know many young women loved about her is that not only was she Catwoman and an actress and a singer, but she had, uh, she was a very strong, she was an activist. And she stood up for what she thought was important. Now, it has gone down in infamy, and maybe you can tell our listeners about it if they don't know. What was the White House incident with Eartha? You know, it's so funny. There are times when you would listen to uh, my mother talk, and she she would make it sound like, you, you, you know, oh, that happened. It was, so, it was so innocent. But I don't know. I don't think anything was really that innocent. She was given uh, an invite to a luncheon uh, with Lady Bird Johnson at the White House, um, and there would have there were I think a couple of hundred other women there, um, and she accepted it because my mother always took the opportunity because you never knew you know when you could actually use your celebrity to actually make a statement. She was 
against the Vietnam War. Mm-hmm. Um, she didn't, uh, as many people were, she didn't understand you know, our, our involvement, as many people questioned. And I think she thought that this may possibly lead to an opportunity, which, of course, it did. Um, the president, President Johnson, did enter the room at one point. They, they did have a, a, a meeting, my mother and him, but they, there were no real words. You know, it was sort of just a, a niceties a thing. What, what happened during the luncheon was they asked the question of the day. And I, uh, they went around the room, and, and several women got up and, and spoke. And the question of the day was, why do you think there's so much juvenile delinquency in the streets of America? Mm. And my mother took the opportunity to stand up and speak her mind that she felt that it had um, that the issues, the unrest in the in the cities and in, in the in the United States had to do with our involvement in Vietnam, and she didn't understand why we were there. And from then, you know, obviously it was taken to the press, and the press said that my mother made Lady Bird uh, cry. Uh, my mother says she did not see Mrs. Johnson cry. She did it, you know, but she, I don't know. But, but she, um, the press said that my mother uh, yelled. Um, my mother claims that she, she did not, you know, she did not, she, did, she was not disrespectful and that she did not raise her voice, mm-hmm. which doesn't surprise me. My mother was not one to, to scream or yell, even as a, even in, a, in her parenting. So mm-hmm. um, she was, you know, she had a very difficult, uh, the response was, was quick and destructive to her career from the from the White House and when years later when Watergate broke um, I think it was Seymour Hersh from the New York Times who, who called my mother on the phone and said that there was a CIA dossier um, on my mother um, at trying to find that she, you know trying to make see if she was a communist or how anti-American and um, which none of which was ever corroborated but um, yeah, she. I mean, she really. She was very hurt by the government um, turning on her because, in my mother's face, she, she she said she would say to me, you know, I took their freedom of speech <laughs> very literally, and I went to the place, the house where you're supposed to have the most freedom of speech. I would think the White House represented that, and I just <laughs> spoke my mind, and for that I was penalized. Um, well, to have a CIA actually, file on you, I mean, she's in good company. I mean, her, John Lennon, <laughs> all, all the great people of the world. But did she go through, I, I know it was like she's being watched by the government and this and that, and that's unnerving on its own. Did she go through Hollywood blacklisting? I know there was a big Hollywood blacklist yeah. scam. She did. Yes. Um, yeah, it was It was determined and, and, and unveiled, you know, um, revealed that, that the government, and it apparently came directly from um President Johnson himself, mm. that he sent the word out to all the networks and all of the big, you know, she played Vegas um, all the time. She played Caesar's Palace in Vegas and um, many other, you know, around, around the country and the Mike Douglas show and Merv Griffin and all of the main talk shows that he, that he did not want to see that woman's face on anywhere. Wow. wow. And you know, that kind of parallels today. In, in a way, what would your yeah. can you speculate as you know? I I don't I hesitate at asking anybody this question because you can't know. You can only speculate. You speculate what your mother would think of the current uh, situation in the White House, or well, um, I think on some level she she I mean I, I think she'd be embarrassed because I feel that she she would feel that the, that the <laughs> my mother's very much about manners and, and being and being a, and being classy mm-hmm. you can you can speak your mind but you have to be you know you have to be classy and you have to be polite and you have to be um, respectful yeah. so I think she'd have a big issue with uh, some of those um, things and I think that it would be uh, hard for her to hold her tongue. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a part of me as the daughter of who would be mortified but ha- would try to keep her quiet all the time. I'm sort of glad she's not dissing anything. <laughs> <laughs> I- I've got to ask you just one personal question about you. What yes. of your mother's traits do you share that are good and bad? I mean, what is one of your mother's best traits is just like you? And what is one of your mother's worst traits that you inherited? So one of my mother's best traits was to not take herself too seriously and to find humor in every situation 
no matter how dire or how you know awful in the moment even when i mean and i say that having been at my mother's side when she was dying right. and um you know she was all about you've got to be she, she would get up every single morning and she would open the window and she would say thank you god for letting me see letting me breathe letting me speak and letting me hear and that's what she understood every single day, the blessing of waking up every day and being able to appreciate everything that life gives you. So uh, she gave me that. I think I carry that trait on a daily basis. I think that I, for the most part, um, in fact, my family will tell you, well, my family will tell you, my children will tell you that I'm not funny. I think I'm hysterical, of course. <laughs> my mother thought I was the funniest thing ever, but I am an only child. She didn't have much choice. So that, I would say, is a, is a trait of hers because, you know, she she would, she would was a jokester, which is so people don't realize. She loves to play practical jokes. I don't really play practical jokes, but um, I am incredibly sarcastic and, you know, constantly finding the humor, even, you know, even on the way to a, you know, a horrible mess or whatever, you know, a funeral or something. Um, what would be the my mother's worst trait that I have? Wow, I'm not, um, um, I think my mother was incredibly loyal, I think, and I'm not saying it's a bad trait, but I think sometimes it can be too loyal, Yeah. Right. Um, and you stay in situations and you stay with people because of that loyalty that, you know, may not be the best thing. I think that I do that. I also, um, my mother wasn't quick to anger because she didn't really show her anger. She could be a little, she could be acerbic, and I think that that um, that I can be incredibly acerbic to um, to people who know me, not to strangers. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Why aren't you that way to the strangers? Like the taxi cab driver, you're the nicest person to me. You like turn on me in a heartbeat. And, um, <laughs> so I think that that that's something I can I can be you know very um, strong you know a little too strong with with my words mm. well times. I wanted to ask you I mean I don't know uh, if growing up if you would travel with your mom or if you were on set or would go to different productions and things like that when she was performing but I know that um, when you as an adult you actually got involved uh, with Eartha's career for a while, and I believe as of 2002, you actually managed her tours and recording career, and were the production manager at Eartha Kit Productions for a while. Is, is that That's, correct? That is correct, and and I will. I highly recommend nepotism. By the way, it's a great way to get a job. <laughs> um, there, there. You know, my mother really felt that the best education you can possibly receive anywhere is travel and learning uh, how other people live and how other cultures what their beliefs are and it's, it's not about um, it's about learning because that gives you the respect to be able to respect uh, other people mm -hmm. my mother was blessed that that uh, as her, as her career was was put on hold in some ways in this country um, because she had already become world you know internationally famous that we're um, gigs, a word my mother hated, you know, a gig, where the gigs would fall apart, you know, here in, in the United States, um, other countries and other places around the world would pick them up. And so we were lucky, to, she was lucky to be able to be, a, you know, world, world traveler. Mm -hmm. She thought that that was more important for me to be able to do that than to be in a school in, and learn from books, right. even though she knew the ed power of education and reading in books was very important. So I did travel the world with my mother and went to so many different countries and when my mother when we would travel my when my mother traveled she didn't just stay in the beautiful hotels and get the life of a, of a celebrity luxury life of a celebrity she believed that in order if you're going to be allowed and you're privileged enough to go to other countries you should really go and see how people live right. and so my mother would talk to taxi drivers and hotel staff and she would ask them you know, where they shop, um, what neighborhoods they live in, you know, can we come to their homes? And she would really learn how different cultures, um, you know, what what they what they what they did every day, and what they you know what they believed in, what they talked about, what they read, what they. And so she exposed me to that. Now, I grew up a little differently. You know, I like to say my mother grew up. In, I grew up in the South too. I was my, I was South Carol, South Carol, 
California, Southern California. She was South Carolina. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, she big, grew up big in difference. Place. I grew up in Beverly Hills. A little bit different. Yeah. So you know, you're dragging me. She's dragging me to these places, and sometimes they're not. You know, they're not exactly the 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 highlights of where you the tourists would be going. I remember when we were in Bangkok, and my mother insisted we go to this open air market. And, um, you know, all I wanted to do was stay in the hotel in the air conditioning and watch TV because that's what you do as a 12 year old. Yeah. Um, but my mother didn't, you know, that didn't, first of all, you didn't say no to her and it wasn't even going to be an, <laughs> there wasn't even a discussion. <laughs> it wasn't like I said, can I stay in the hotel? It wasn't even, I didn't even open my mouth because that wasn't happening. <laughs> and, you know, so she would take me to these, you know, she would, and I say drag me because she did drag me. Right. Um, but the experience that I had, with the learning that, you know, when you look back as, a, as an adult, and I was blessed to see that at 30 and 40 and 50, that, you know, what she, the gifts that I was given, you know, I knew right away that, because, you know, the life I lived in Beverly Hills, California, was not the real world. I mean, this was, you know, this was all an illusion, and the entertainment biz- business was an illusion, mm-hmm. and how people live in, in, you know, in Africa and in Bangkok and in, you know, in, in other places, in Mexico, South America, and any, wherever you go, any place in Europe, when you really see how, how other people function and y- you learn differently and you have respect and you learn how, how lucky you are in the world. And she gave me that book. You know, that's a gift that, that you can't, you can't get, get in a book. Right. And you can't just teach by telling somebody. Right. Now, I want to talk a little bit about SimplyEartha.com and your jewelry line. Uh, tell our listeners a little bit. First of all, I want to compliment you, Kit, because I'm a huge Eartha Kit fan. And I read your website and the section where you're talking about, uh, you know, about me kind of a thing. The, I don't know if you wrote it. I believe you wrote it. Beautifully written did, yeah. about the relationship between you and your mom, the quotes and everything Thank that you, you had put in there. I mean, literally, it's so heartfelt. You can feel that when you're reading it. Um, so I wanted to compliment you. you on that. But tell our listeners a little bit about the jewelry line, about the website. I encourage our listeners to go there. And what did Eartha think of this this new adventure into jewelry and designing the line? Well, a couple of things. First of all, my mother was <laughs> was not a jewelry wearer. She didn't like to wear, <laughs> didn't like to have those things. She didn't think they were necessary. She didn't. Well, I remember when we attended the Tonys. Uh, um, in the year, in year 2000 and she was wearing um, I don't even know how many millions of dollars in Harry Winston um, jewels and she was so uncomfortable <laughs> and she couldn't wait to get these diamonds off of her because she said it just the responsibility was just more than you know she would say to me don't give me diamonds don't give me jewels give me land because they're not making any more of that right. so <laughs> that to her was you know, more important than than, than diamonds and, and jewelry. So mm-hmm. the irony of, of that I went into, you know, the sort of that's sort of the re- the rebellious part of me. I'm going to show you. I'm going to make. I'm going to turn you into a diamond. I, actually, before she died, we we did talk. We did joke about that because you can. There is a process, I guess, that that takes the the ashes um, mm-hmm. and they they the carbon and the ashes, and they you can make a diamond out of it. Right. There's, there are several companies that do that. So um, before my, uh, the last few months of my mother's life, you know, we used to joke about, you know, I used to say, you know, after you go, I'm going to put you, I'm going to trap you inside a diamond. I'm going to wear, and I'm going to wear you all the time. <laughs> what, what color, what, what shape and what color am I going to be? And so, you know, so that was always a funny thing. But um, my mother always said to me my entire life, I am working and building a brand and a name that when I die, do not let it die with me. Yeah. The songs that I sing, the television, the film, the, the, the things that I do, those will be documented for life. Who I am as a person, how I was as a mother, how I am as a human being is, the, is the, the, what I've given you. And it's for you to carry that on. Right. And like I said, I was very good at being the daughter. <laughs> and I, was, I listened. I was, it was like, okay, so I'm supposed to do something with this. I'm not just supposed to sit there after she goes. I'm supposed to you know, share who she was um, and, and, and how wonderful that is to be able to do. I mean, what a blessing I have to be able to tell people the kind of person that she was, it, how she believed in, in equality, but not just for people, but in equality for, for all things. You know, mm-hmm. she was an advocate for the environment. She was an advocate for, for recycling, for eating healthy and organic. 
Um, as a tiny little girl, we had a vegetable garden in Be- Beverly Hills, California, um, <laughs> and I would sit on the ground as my mother would pick the vegetables, and I remember once seeing a slug, you know, and the slimy little slugs going around, and I said to my mother, ew, you know, kill it, it's disgusting. And she said to me, you don't have to like it, but you don't have the right to end its life just right. because you don't like the way it looks. Right. Mm. And I remember, you know, as an adult, like, thinking back on those moments and, like, wow, that was so profound. I mean, you know, as a three-year-old, I was like, okay, fine, whatever, I'll go over to this plant. I mean, you know, I mean, I wasn't really giving much thought to the, you know, I was bad that she wouldn't kill the slug. But as an adult, when you realize what she was really telling me, you know, you have to respect everything. Everything on this planet is here for a reason. Right. That includes you. Yep. So you don't waste it. And, and you don't you don't deny somebody else's you know existence. Yeah. So when when she died, as horrible as it was, yeah, um, I, I read about that. That really bothered me when I read about it. It was really hard for her to go. And, and I guess you said she was yelling out and she was seeing things that wasn't there. Which, in my opinion, maybe she did see somebody or something. Right. Well, I have to say, hospice nurses said that they they almost you know many of them often have their patients who, who claim that they see things and they don't, you know, yeah. they don't know if it's actually true or not, but it, it's something that they've, saw, saw, they've seen. Now, the hospice nurse did say to me, uh, my mother had colon cancer and um, unfortunately, a disease that is treatable and beatable if it's caught early enough, but um, unfortunately hers was not. Um, the hospice nurse did say to me that she was going to at some point just, you know, slowly fade and, you know, and, and it, when she stopped drinking water, she'd stop eating, and she would slowly fade. Um, And that's how she would go. And that is not how my mother left this planet. (laughs) It was so, my mother literally left this planet screaming at the top of her lungs. Um, She'd lost her ability to speak, uh, her uh, her words at that point, but um, she could hear and understand and and certainly communicated to me that she didn't want to go. And I remember saying after she's gone, you know, I don't know who was meeting her at the pearly gates, but they better be prepared to get yeah. them, an unwanted visitor you know, because she wasn't coming voluntarily. Right. Mm-hmm. And it sort of, it, it showed me that instinct, that survival instinct that she, is how she made it through this life as, as this, you know, single woman um, on her own with no family and, you know, until I came along. But I mean, it, it showed me that she she had this this innate strength and this desire to keep going even when all hope was was lost, wow. and um, and that to me was I mean as, as sad as as horrible as it was, it was yet another learning experience that I had with my mother and mm-hmm. and this you know, this example, and so after she left I me mean, the first I have to say the first year was was very difficult. We lived very close to each other. We lived three miles away. And I had, as you mentioned, um, I worked for Eartha Kit Productions and, right. and toured with her along with my children um, many, many times. And so the, just the realization of no longer being, you know, the daughter of, you know, sort of like, well, who am, now who am I? You know, right. and I have, and I carry on her name. And, and it was just, it was a very difficult, um, a difficult year. And as I went through this year, and as I, I you know, I would, you, you, my, my mother's song, Santa Baby, every, you know, every season of Christmas season, you, that song comes up, and, and luckily, you know, I've been, she was blessed to have a lot of other um, licensing that, you know, her songs are often used in movies and television mm-hmm. and, and other um, advertising. So I would often be in, you know, in a random place like, you know, Bed Bath and Beyond, and all of a sudden I hear my mother's voice. <laughs> That's kind of an eerie, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very surreal thing um, when that person is no longer here. I'm glad you and said I that because I didn't want you to think I was crazy because I really got to believe your mother is still around you. I really do. Well, my mother died on Christmas Day. Right. And her biggest song was Santa Baby. Yeah. And I remember saying, well, you knew that was going to happen. She <laughs> wasn't leaving. She wasn't going to make you make it sure everybody in the world knew that that was her song. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Aside from the fact that it's the least convenient day to try to get the funeral home to ever come to get a body on Christmas Day. But aside from those little details, you know, she, she was, you know, to the end. I mean, to this day, 
yes, and she is absolutely around me, and I know she is, and I feel her, and I, you know, I still talk to her, and it, and I still laugh, even though you know she's she, and I think she's probably laughing too. And so I started to really take so many of her words. My mother wrote, if I tell you she had, I have thousands of pieces of paper. She would write down thoughts um, on napkins, on legal, you know, yellow legal paper, on beautiful leather bound, you know, diaries and journals. Mm. She would just constantly, was constantly, constantly writing. Um, And so I have all of her words in her hand, in her handwriting. So I started wow. to look at these words and realize these words are so impactful. You know, they may be very simple. I mean, some things that she would say to me, you know, God may not be there when you want him, but he's always on time. Right. Um, one other thing that she said was, you know, I've taken all the manure that's been thrown on me and used it as fertilizer. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, a simple thing that she would often say to me was, don't panic. You know, it doesn't change a thing, and it just makes it difficult to see clearly are the opportunities that may be in front of you or the lessons that maybe you're supposed to learn. Right. So as I started to really like look at these words, um, the year after she died, I decided to do a little, a little book in the power of technology today. I used my little handy dandy, you know, Mac <laughs> and made this little Mac, um, this book, um, of compiled of some photographs and these phrases that she said, which my mother coined in her, you know, when she was alive, she would call them kidism. Mm. Now, these were not things that she necessarily (laughs) made up, you know, they're not, I mean, don't panic is the same as, you know, keep calm and carry on, Mm -hmm. I mean, these are not, uh, they're they're, they're, they're words that she maybe heard other people say, or she would then um, make them her own, but once she said them, it didn't matter who else had ever said them, I mean, you know, (laughs) Einstein could have said it, and it was all of a sudden, you know, no, I said that first, so... Um, so I made this book of kidisms, um, and I u- and I paired them with uh, her, some images, and I sent them to the people who were important in her life. Um, you know, and I think I made maybe like you know sixty or seventy copies, and people responded to them saying, "You should do something with these words." Yeah, this for is, sure. You need to stir this. You need to do this. Is this is so topical and and timely and she was so ahead of her time and you know yeah yeah that so that's how the that's how the simply earth align uh came to be is that i started to incorporate these words into different designs and so, you know at first they were you know bigger they were sort of pieces of artwork and then and then i used her handwriting and then of course people couldn't read her handwriting so then i had to <laughs> come up with a font and it's you know, so it was an evolution. And then someone said to me, oh, my gosh, you need to have that as a bracelet. you got to take those words. You know, it was, I think it was don't panic. And someone said, you got to put right. that on a bracelet. I need to wear that. Wow. That's interesting. Um, I have the words to- don't panic tattooed on my wrist. So mm-hmm. I, I didn't need the bracelet because I they're, they're, they're <laughs> <in my head. laughs> Um And so I thought, wow, that's really interesting to put it on a bracelet. What, and then... I took her hand-drawn heart because she used to always draw these hearts, mm-hmm. and and then I and then I took the song "Here's to Life," which was the song she closed her concerts with, and so it's kind of just you know it came to this where I started to use the hand-drawn heart and, on necklaces and and bracelets and on dog tags, and that's how Simply Earth the like the brand evolved, and 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 I made. Then I started to do these blankets, these incredible blankets. Everything is made in the United States because my mother was very much about made in the U.S. Right. She really right. felt that having lost the artisans and, and sent so much of our manufacturing overseas was really the start of the of, of a downfall for for our country. Are, so are you kind of like spreading? <clears throat> are you kind of like spreading these phrases throughout? Artwork and jewelry and stuff. I mean, what about an actual book itself? Did you publish what you gave to your friends? Uh, you know, I've, and I am... Uh, there, now I've sort of come to the place where there's so many of these kids. I was like, where do you start? And where do you, <laughs> yes, I do need to... That's my next project is... Um, <laughs> his story is putting it... Is doing it as a, you know, maybe a coffee table book or or just, you know, like... Or just even a little book that, yeah. that you just have the words and, and share them. Um, yeah, and, and when, when I do the pieces, 
I do put a little card. I explain, you know, what what she maybe there's a little backstory to the, to where the words came from. Right. Um, so that's how that and that, and that that's you know it's sort of like evolved. This is sort of my my way of taking my mother, sharing my mother, sharing my mother's relationship, sharing her her teachings and her parenting and her incredible um, unconditional love that she had for me, which is the greatest gift you can give any child um, is knowing how much your parent loves you. Well, as Um, the keeper, and rightfully so, of your mother's legacy and and her aura and her persona and her image, uh, one of these days, I assume, is going to be an Eartha Kitt movie. And, and, you know, I don't know how you feel about that. Uh, Well, we do... Go ahead. The funny thing that my mother did start, we started actually working on a movie while she was alive. Oh. And the beauty is, is that she, um, and, and I have two, um, two producing partners, and, and she was imparted her entire life to um, this woman, Lenore Kletter, who um, is a screenwriter. And Lenore has probably the most knowledge of, of, of my mother's life than anybody who walking this earth, um, including myself. And so we started this project, and we are now what looks to be knock wood, from my mouth to God's ears, um, ready to, to put together a package and shop it, uh, awesome. my mother's life story. Well, you know, I wanted to ask, because I didn't see this, and I don't know what it is, but there was something called Drunk History, and I don't know if it's good or bad. I assume it's bad because of the title, but some actress by the name of Tessa Thompson Captain, right. Yeah, what did you think about it? I don't even know what it was about. It was good or negative. I, did, or... I actually didn't see it. I know that Tessa Thompson is a couple of times. I think she's been a big admirer of my mother. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as my mother always said, it doesn't matter what you say about me, just spell my name right. right. Um, <laughs> so I really think that, you know, anytime people are talking about you, I mean, hopefully it's always going to be positive, but and, and, um, it just shows the impact that that person has had on someone else's life, and I think that there are so many times. I mean, we have our, our the Facebook page, which is the Eartha Kit, um, and you know we've got, we've about one hundred and eighty thousand, maybe one hundred eighty thousand followers on there, and a lot of them. The demographic is very young. Mm. It's, it's it's mostly women, thirty five, uh, even younger. Actually, it's like twenty six to to forty two, something like that. Wow, which is fascinating yeah. to me because obviously many of these women you know aren't really that knowledgeable about my mother's career when she was alive um but they but her the impact that she had as a as a female uh as a strong role model um of someone who stayed true to herself and who uh, obviously beautiful and and pinup girl worthy mm-hmm. um you know and and insightful and intelligent and you know, able to to really see, you know, to to see the importance of life and to understand, is really interesting. That that that's what uh, so many people gravitate towards and hang on to and and go for. And so when I see other women, especially portraying her in, in any form or fashion, it's just to me, it's like, wow, she really, you know, look at that. She's that's very cool. That's very cool that my mother had that impact. On, on one person. My mother used to tell me, she, we, she would teach me how to, to, to throw stones, you know, pebbles, where you mm-hmm. skip stones on the, in the water. And as a little kid, you take the big rock, right, and you go and you plop in the, in the pond, and you have the huge ripples. My mother would say, you see, when you put the big rock in like that, and you see the big waves, those ripples, you know, they make, the, you see how they affect the, the change, they change the shoreline. But when you throw a little pebble in the, in the pond, the ripples are much smaller. Mm. But they too affect change. Right. It may take longer, and it may take more of them. But everything will affect change, and that, to me, is my mother. What my mother understood. It wasn't her need to be the most famous and to make the biggest, biggest impact. But her, her, the importance to her was to make an impact on one person that was significant. And I believe she's done that. Um, um, teen times. Well, I, I know who you thought was the best Catwoman. Who did your mother think was the best Catwoman? <laughs> your mother thinks she was oh. the best? Why not? Of course she did. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
No, uh, <laughs> yes, you know, this is not a woman who was, you know, who, 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 you know, would shy away from complimenting herself. Now, it sounded like, uh, from from hearing and, and perspective, it sounded like. Eartha was a great mom and and very much valued that role as mother. I know that, you know, she didn't really know her her biological mom uh, too much. Um, What about as a grandma? What was Eartha like as a grandma? So that's an interesting interesting question because my mother was a better mother than she was a grandmother. Mm -hmm. And I think there were a lot of reasons for that, and I'm sure, you know, therapists could have their field day here. <laughs> um, I, bl- I think that on some level, my mother felt that my children took me away from her. Oh, okay. You know, that fear, oh, that, that yeah. fear of losing me, mm-hmm. which she always sort of had, because the people who were important to her as a child, you know, that impact that we had, that we were, uh, of those formative years, sets us up for so everything the rest of our lives. So I think that that sort of was hard for her to to sort of come to terms with. My firstborn was was my son, and my mother had a struggle, you know, with men in her life of being hurt and and um, the my mother's mother, you know, gave her up right. for a man, right. and I think that really stuck in my mother's, you know. Uh, emotionally. So she didn't know what to do with this boy. I mean, it was like, <laughs> on the one hand, she'd say, that's good, you have the boy first, because that's exactly how it's supposed to be. Yeah. But then on the other hand, she'd be, you know, uh, what do I do with this thing? I don't even know what to do. <laughs> um, you know, but my, and the funny thing is my son, who looks so much like me, and um, but is actually so much like my mother. Mm. And it's so interesting to see that, you know, genetics turn out. He actually looks more like my mother. He's got He's got more of the ethnic mix look to him, mm-hmm. um, and but what was really funny is that we did a piece for People magazine, and, and and my mother told them my son's name is Jason, and she told them that his name was Justin. Okay. <laughs> and I said, his name's not Justin, Mom. It's Jason. Oh hell, my grandmother, my like grandmother Justin. didn't know my name like either. Justin's, <laughs> Justin's a better name. <laughs> <laughs> so, then when my daughter was born. It was like she saw her, you know, it was like reliving her life with me. Right. So she was much more understanding of my daughter. Now, the, I, the, my daughter is also now a singer-songwriter. Oh. And has, has a very sensitivity to the world that my mother had. Um, and she's, I think, quite a, quite a gifted um, songwriter. And so, you know, I think it's an it's an interesting thing that, you know, she was conflicted because she knew she's supposed to love these kids and they're mine and she did love them and she adored them. But yet, on the other hand, you know, I was the most important thing to Well, maybe your daughter could play your mother in a movie, but how would she feel about putting on the Catwoman suit? <laughs> well, my, well, yeah, my daughter would be very fine with putting on the Catwoman suit, trust me. But <laughs> the problem is my daughter looks like a nice Jewish girl from Long Island. So oh. I don't think they look like <laughs> 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 well, as we as we wrap, I don't think that's going to work so well. Right. As we, <laughs> a lot of makeup. <laughs> as we wrap this up, let me just ask you that. I mean, knowing uh, you know that that you are carrying on Eartha's legacy, and knowing that hopefully you're going to be shopping around this movie, and 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 you know we pray that this actually happens and comes to fruition. If you can pick, who do you want to play Eartha in the film? Oh, you know, I hate to do that because it's so difficult to then, you know, then I feel like I've been pigeonholed, then it's not going to be that person. Um, There's so many talented women out there, there really are. I think physically, if I was to choose someone who looks like my mother, um, Mm -hmm. Tandy Newton. Okay. Looks very much like my mother. Mm -hmm. Um, I've actually met Tandy and, and we have had this discussion, so... Um, but you know, but that being said, there are so many people, and there may be people who don't even I don't even know exist. Right, yet. right. Um, so, and I and I don't think necessarily. I mean, you know, having the mannerisms; so those are all things you can learn. It's just the under, the really feeling passionate about the story of who my mother was, because she was so much more than just 
you know, the sex symbol, that sex kitten right. um, on the stage. And so much of that, as my mother said, you know, made her angry that, that the record labels in the 1950s, you know, wanted that, that, lay, that, 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 that image that you saw, Bad Earther, that was actually a title of, of one of the RCA albums, you know, mm-hmm. um, that Bad Earther. Yeah, so, perfect. You know, so that was sort of, that was a, 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 an image that they wanted to put out there um, because it's, you know, it sells. Right. So, and my mother wasn't always comfortable with it, but she knew that, you know, sometimes you got to play the game in order to make it work to your advantage. Well, I know your daughter does, but what about you? Do you sing at all? Yeah, uh, no, the talent clearly skipped a generation. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're you're beautiful. I'm, you're beautiful like your I'm mother. The, well, so. I thank you. I am going. To, my legacy is going to be. I'm going to go from being the daughter of to being the mother of. That's and I'm fine. I ride coattails really well. So. <laughs> Well, we encourage all of our listeners to head over to Kit's website. Head over to it at simplyeartha.com. And then also, uh, I know you had briefly mentioned it earlier, Kit, but as we uh, wrap up here, let our listeners know where can they find you on social media. Um, I am on Instagram at Kit, K-I-T-T, Shapiro, S-H-A-P-I-R-O. I am also on Facebook and all the other in, you know, social media sites that you can find. Um, Simply Eartha is also on Instagram and Facebook, and the, the website, the, the Facebook site for Eartha Kit, the official site is the Eartha Kit. So, um, and my Facebook, I think my Facebook page is Kit Shapiro Page. Perfect. And you have to pick all these different, you know. Right. Some, you would think Kit Shapiro would be like the most original name on the planet, but about. <laughs> well, <So. laughs> perfect. Kit, I want to thank you so much for joining us uh, to talk about your mom's life and legacy and also what you're doing to keep her spirit alive. And I thank you for that because yeah. as a fan of Eartha's, it's great to see that. Well, I thank you for having me. And to me, it's, you know, I happen... I'm sharing a mother-daughter relationship, which was an amazing love story, and we all have either um, somebody in our lives that we can relate to, who, who we felt that way about, or maybe we wanted to have and we felt that way about. And, right. and I think it's important. We all have a legacy to share on some level, and, and I think that that's what history is. We need to remember those people. And when you go for backing for the film, go to the Kit Kat Candy Company. Because <laughs> <laughs> yes. That would be perfect. <laughs> and every Batman fan okay. should ad- should adopt a nice little female kitty and name her Eartha. Because yes. I think that would be a great, great uh, thing of respect for your mother. Be careful if you name her Eartha. You know, I'd like you know, make sure those you keep those claws a certain distance away from your face. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Kit. And I hope you have All a great right. rest. It was of your very week. nice speaking to both of you. Thank you for Thank having you. me. Absolutely. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thank All you. Right. You too. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye.